Hello and welcome back. Coffee with Carl, number 20. And I'm sorry I wasn't here last week. You know, the kids, man, they come home from elementary school and they share everything. They share their projects, their germs, especially their germs. And I, uh, the whole house just was taken down. It's like dominoes. You know, one of the kids goes, then one of the other ones, and my wife, and then me. It's just how it happens. And, and when I can't speak well, I feel like I'm just, I can't do this. You know what I mean? So it really didn't, I felt okay, you know, a little fuzzy, whatever, but it was mostly my speaking voice and you could probably still hear a little bit of it going on, but either way, I'm so glad to be back though. Uh, it feels good to, to be talking to a camera again and uh, I missed you guys. So I hope you're doing well. Now, the first thing I want to talk about is last episode, I talked about three different CRKT. Yeah, CRKT, yeah. That I said I wanted to check out. And I, I was like, all right, well, they're all so different. And, and you guys chimed in and gave me your thoughts, which was great. Well, of course, you know, why buy one or two when you could just buy all three and see which one you like? <laughs> now, the reason I bought all three is not because I'm a, well, it is because I'm a pain in the ass um, who uh, indulges himself a bit too much, but also because they're pretty inexpensive. I don't think one of these is over a hundred bucks. So, you know, when you're talking about the world of custom knives, that's a relative bargain, which is kind of why I liked this company. Again, I was just like, you know, I remember them from my days before of, uh, you know, uh, having my first, uh, I have to find it around here, my first M16 knife, and it was great. And uh, now I have these, so this is really cool. It kind of come full, full circle. Now I've had a chance to carry all three of these knives. I do have my favorite, but I'll get to that a little bit later on. Let's start off though. So this, this guy right here, this is the big boy. And now this is the, M16 140 SFG, and it's a monster. Now, I mean, I, this is the biggest blade I've ever carried. It's enormous, it's heavy. It doesn't even try to get like out of its own way. It's just, a. it's like carrying around an, an Abrams tank. It's huge, and even the color is kind of appropriate. Now I got a Tanto blade here, and I, I really like that. Um, you know, something with a belly on it, because I find that that's the, the area that I use the most. Not really the tip. It's usually that, and I find that that's very effective. These serrations are really, really cool. They have, if you if you can see them, they almost have like a backward uh, cut to them. So they almost look a bit like, like shark's teeth or something like that. But I've heard that these are especially effective when cutting rope and stuff like that. Now, I haven't had to do that yet. However, um, I'm going to be taking some trees down the yard soon, and often I use rope, and it gets bound up, and I'll probably be using this pretty soon. The other thing that I like about this is it has this kind of, uh, there's, I'm sure there's a name for this type of lock, but it basically has like a two, two way lock. So what you do is you basically, you pull this little lever back here, then it has a liner lock. So it's like a two stage type deal and then you can close it. And if you try to pull that liner lock without that little safety enabled, you, you just can't do it. So you have to pull that back, liner lock to the side, then it'll close. But if you try to do one or the other, it will not. So. It's kind of cool, just another stage of safety, which I like, and it took a little while to get it with one hand. I'm able to do it now, though. You kind of like, you know, pointer finger there, liner lock, and then it has that back thing, and you can get it to that point. So you can do it with one hand. Being able to do things with one hand is a big deal for me, and especially back in the day when I was really using my knife a lot, um, I'd be holding something, and I'd be able to flip my, my knife out and then be able to put it away. Now, that's a bit cumbersome to do every single time, but... If this is the kind of safety you need, then then I think it should be fine. It's a bad boy. I mean, it, this is a big, big knife that I don't really need. I don't see myself needing anytime soon. However, like I said, if I'm taking down trees, if I'm working out in the yard, if I'm doing stuff like that, um, or if I was like going to go camping or something, I needed a blade with a bit more, you know, function to it and size. This would probably be the one that I would bring. This guy right here. Let's start off. Let's go back. Look, okay, we're going to do the smallest one now. This is the uh, CEO. And I like this little guy. It reminds me, just in, in shape of like a, there's a name for this type of weapon and I can't remember what it is. It's more or less a long rod with a blade at the end of it, but has this sort of katana look to it, I guess. If I don't think that's probably the name, but whatever. You know what I mean? It's great because of how small and lightweight and it just disappears. This thing, you can literally, and I did put it in my shirt pocket, in my pencil sleeve, and then you can take that thing out. Now, it's a little small, for, you know, blue collar type tasks. You could certainly use it, but again, it's called the the CEO, right? So I think that obviously what this is meant for is letter opening, uh, office work, opening up packages, just something that's a little bit less 
you know, in your face. I mean, you're in the office and you go, oh, I got it, guys, don't worry. And you pull this thing out. People are going to start looking at you a little weird, right? Especially if you're in a like a very formal office. This right here would be, again, considered like a gentleman's carry, I think. So there's no way to open it except for that little, you know, uh, finger thing, whatever the hell that's called. You know what I'm saying? The little flipper thing. And I got to say, this has one of the nicest sounds. I love that. It's just you hear like a little and then a, it's really, really nice. Did you get that? Anyway, uh, I like this guy. I also like the fact that they went with a really deep carry pocket clip on this. So this thing carries really low in your pocket. You don't even see it. It's also black, no like fancy stuff on the clip that makes it look super tactical or anything like that. Not even any cutouts. If you didn't know any better, you might think this was a pen, which is nice. And I think, again, that's the whole point of this. So if you're going to a meeting or if you're in a place where you, if, if you're at a wedding, right? You need knives everywhere. You're going to a wedding, you're probably not gonna carry this. You might not even carry this, but this, totally possible. So I think this is a fantastic alternative to like my favorite Victorinox Cadet, uh, something like that. And again, in, inexpensive, you know what I mean? So I like it. I'm also not a, a knife snob. I actually prefer knives that are a little bit cheaper. I think they're really, really a lot of fun. So that's the uh, CEO. Again, two totally different use cases, two completely different sizes. This is how spoiled we are these days though. I mean, back in the day, it was like you either carried a Swiss Army knife or you carried maybe like, I don't know, a K-bar. But now with these two, uh, the, the size and use difference is just, it's fantastic. I love it. I love where we are now with, with uh, affordability and variety. Now, the one that I like the most, hands down, is this guy right here. Now this one here, this is their, let me just read it off because I want to tell you which one it is. This is their, oh boy, where's the name for it? There's a name and I'll put it up on the screen for you. This here though is a really special knife. Now again, this was designed by a, all, the, all these I think were designed, except for the M16, I think this was even a design from a pretty famous knife maker. And a lot of times they'll put their names, oh, Rogers Design, that's what the uh, CEO is, okay? I might say SEO and I might get that screwed up, but again, this is Coffee with Carl. We don't do a whole lot of editing around here, unless I sneeze or something like that. Might even leave that in. But this guy right here is something special. Now, the reason I like it so much is the refinement on this and the design, I think, punches so far above its price point that you can hand it to somebody and tell them that it costs $300 and they probably believe you. And what I mean by that is, I love the way that the blade is it's almost belying of the size of the knife itself. So when you actually flip this thing out, so much of it is blade, right? You have a very nice broad blade here, no serrations, so, you know, just plain edge. Then the uh, handle, uh, though, has a really nice spot for your, your pointer finger here, right? So when you actually hold that, you have a nice little fulcrum, and it really just, the ergonomics of this are spectacular. So this is a frame lock, so the frame actually comes in and prevents that from coming back on you. But when you start looking at everything else, all the little edges are nicely polished. Even the back side of this is rounded off rather than just being cut. It's nice and nice and rounded. The the edge on this one is serious. Now again, this also comes in an upgraded blade steel. Um, so you know you're getting kind of a, a higher end knife. I just think this is a tremendous value, and I think these are. I can't remember if this is G10 scales or not, but I don't know. I mean, now, of course, this is a bit of a compromise, right? So let me just open all three of these up. I might cut myself on screen today, by the way, with all these knives flying around. And if that happens, hey, you saw it here first, right? So obviously we have three completely different knives and I have my little side camera there. So you can kind of see that these are just three totally different sizes, three different use cases. And again, you know, which one is gonna be your daily driver will depend on what you do for a living. If you're somebody who's out in the trenches all day long, needs something big, can carry something like this, maybe that's your guy. If you're somebody who's in a suit all day or working business casual, this is your guy. For me, it's some combination of the two, and I found that this one here is uh, my favorite. It seems to be the one that I mess around with the most, I fidget with, I like the fact that you can open it very easily with that little flipper, and you can also, it has a nice little eyelet a la Spider Co if you wanna use the little spidey flick or thumb thing. I can't quite get the spidey flick, I don't know why. And I just think it's beautiful. The other thing I noticed about this is, you know, I mean, that would work really well as almost like a, a, a thumb, what do they call that? There's a name for it, but like a thumb ramp. 
right? So if you were actually using this this way, its ergonomics are great that way too. It, it really, I, I was very, very impressed with this. I think this is um, my favorite of the bunch. Now on to the news, some interesting things have come out and I wanna start off with the most shocking of the bunch, which is Momotaro came out with another pair of $2,000 jeans. Well, close enough, these are $1,701. $1. That $1 makes a big difference. Now, these are called the 1605-AI 13 and a half ounce natural indigo azome. Azomi? I don't know, can't pronounce that. Hand dyed natural tapered jeans. Now the, the work that goes into these jeans, as you would expect for that price point, is pretty amazing. And they look great. They look like a pair of jeans. Would I ever buy these? No, no. But I, well, let's talk about the, why they cost so much, okay? And if you might be interested in it. We are thrilled to introduce one of the rarest, most exclusive jeans we have ever seen. Each pair represents the pinnacle of craftsmanship, taking up to a year to produce in extremely limited quantities. Dyed with premium Japanese natural indigo following the traditional Japanese Azomi, Azome method, where the leaves are naturally fermented for over 100 days without any chemicals. Once mature, cotton yarns are hand dipped into the indigo once a day for 30 days, creating the rich, vibrant indigo hues Azomi is known for. With the hand woven natural indigo sashiko patch, luxurious silk yoke lining, and custom eight, uh, 925 silver hardware, they stand as a true masterpiece of craftsmanship and exclusivity. Now, interestingly enough, these are sold out in all but 32, 33, and 34 sizes. So obviously, people are buying them. I can't believe it, but people are buying these. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I think that you should be able to spend your money on whatever it is. I think that, you know, if people think it's crazy, that's fine. There are people who spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on watches. There are people who spend, you know, that much on cars. People like me would spend that on a house, okay? So I think most of us are pretty reasonable, but let's say you're somebody with cash to burn. And it's, it's one of the things that you love is this expensive kind of, you know, craftsmanship and denim and all that stuff. And you're looking for the pinnacle. And I actually do like the fact that a company like Momotaro is pushing the envelope and really trying to find the end level of craftsmanship. Gotta have respect for that. Russell Moccasin may have re-released these or, or maybe they're a new model, I'm not really sure. It's called the Zephyr. And to me, it looks like a combination of work boot and sort of the traditional Russell Moccasin look. And what's interesting about these, not only the fact that they look like a combination, the strangest combination I've ever seen of mock toe, work boot, engineer boot, and moccasin uh, I've ever seen, very cool, but it also has a zipper down the back. That's pretty interesting. That, um, it's not the first time it's ever been done, but it's the first time I've ever seen it on a boot of this type. And I really would love to find out how these actually work. I think it's brilliant. Now, zippers on boots, a lot of people think that's a no-no. I have found that it makes getting in and out of them very, very easy. And the only time I've ever had a zipper fail on me was an old pair of Harley Davidson boots that I had. They had side zips on them on the inside. And um, after a little while, they just wore out. And a zipper is very, very easy to replace. However, Russell Moccasin is a fascinating company. I've never really talked about them, but I wanna change that this year because they've been around for over 100 years. They have been worn by some extremely prominent people who have done some amazing things. Uh, I believe Michael from the Iron Snail did a video about a pair of their hiking boots a while back. There are plenty of hikers and hunters and people who you know do a lot of outdoor kind of things who will wear nothing but the Russells. And it's just cool because their method of construction, I believe is patented and nobody else does it the way that they do. So they're very, very interesting. I would love to cover these guys a little bit more in the future. So this is from Unmarked. This is called, they're called the Archie Boots in tobacco. And they are basically a, a monkey boot, um, you know, lace to toe style but they look very, very cool. And I gotta tell you, like, there's a few things about these that made me stop for a second. And one of those is the interesting back stay. So the back stay is, it's very unique. It kind of comes at the edge of that, that back part of the heel, which I think adds to the whole look of it. I like that a lot. They also have a half sole, and I absolutely love a half sole. And, and just overall, I think they did a nice job. Now, a lot of times, lace to toe or monkey boots, whichever, uh, they can kind of look a little wonky. When they're done wrong, they can almost look like bowling shoes or a weird hybrid of a sneaker. When they're done right though, this is what they look like. They've also done some other things that are functional here, like they've gone up with eyelets, speed hooks, three of them near the top, with a single eyelet at the top of that. Now, 
The eyelet at the top really does help. If you wanna put these on and not have to worry about them sliding off of the, the speed hooks at all, those help you really lock it down. When I'm gonna go work uh, for an extended amount of time and I probably can't stop to tie my shoe or whatever, I'll use that top eyelet just as an extra method of, uh, of safety so that my boots don't come off. But I think these look really, really great. Now, I've never covered unmarked. I would like to, especially seeing this level. I think this this is the first time I've, I've seen an unmarked uh, boot that I've said, you know what? I got to check these guys out. Uh, looks great. And I was shocked that they're $273. $273 for these. What am I missing? <laughs> it looks like some great construction. It looks like they use some really nice, uh, they use the built right sole. They, what, what am I missing? What am I missing? Is this on sale? It is on sale. Okay, originally it was 390. Now we're talking, okay? But still, 273. One of you better go buy these before I do because that, that's a great deal for them. Bradley Mountain came out with a valet tray. Now, I know, I know, I know, valet trays, right? They're a dime a dozen. I probably have three right over there, right? So what's, what's new and unique? What is interesting about these is most of the time when I've seen a valet tray, what it is is a flat piece or circular piece of material, which is then pinched at four corners, creating somewhat of a dish type of thing, right? They're great because especially when you have like a lot of little things, um, I have one near my computer. So when I have all those little like adapters and stuff like that, or, or binder clips, I can throw them in there and it doesn't bother me. It's a good way to keep things organized. I also have one over with my, with my camera stuff and it holds all the little ends and screws and stuff like that. So these are excellent to have. They also work really well if you have any kind of, you know, your ring or jewelry or anything like that that you want to put maybe on your bedside table or something. You get the idea. Now, what's interesting about this one, though, is it's actually made out of a single piece of leather. So somehow they have stamped a piece of leather enough to create that dish, which is really, really cool. So it's 75 bucks, which again, for a piece of leather for a valet tray, might sound like a lot of money, but I think this actually is a pretty cool piece. And again, just because of the way it was made, it looks like it's a decent size. Um, I think this might be a great, uh, it might be a great gift. I mean, it's 10 ounce harness leather, wet formed. Okay, so what they do is they actually wet it first and then they, they can do that. That's how they make holsters and stuff too. And um, really, really nice stuff. So again, under a hundred bucks. If you're looking for a gift for somebody, maybe, there you go. All right, staying on the Bradley Mountain website, I actually saw something there before I clicked away and that's this navigator jacket, which is interesting. And I think it takes a second to kind of like digest it, right? So this is a limited release and they have done sort of the same thing that we did when we did the heat straps. Um, uh, what was it called? The wax lumber jacket, which had the waxed sections over the, the wool. Now this has that same look, but it's all done in wax canvas. Of course, this is a jacket that was more of a shirt jacket. You know, you get the idea and it's $450. Again, only here for a limited amount of time. Let's see what this, the construction is a little bit more. Seven ounce waxed canvas, outer layer, two-tone insulated soft poplin liner. So poplin cotton, um, inside pocket, brass snaps, utility tab made in the USA. I really actually like this. I think that they did a nice job, especially with that two-tone. Bradley Mountain certainly seems to have an eye for, for good color combinations. And I think that using that contrast stitching to create that, that quilted pattern was a bold move, but I think it, I think it really paid off in this, this case. I think it looks really, really nice. They did a great job and it's only around for a little while. So if you want something that's a little bit different, maybe this is your, your thing. Indigo Farah came out with a new version of their Fargo shirt. Now I have actually two of these that they came out with last year. One was the green one with like the gold stitching. The other one was sort of a rust color. And I like Indigo Farah because their stuff is usually more sized for guys like me, right? So if you're a little bit bulkier, then these things will fit you. And a lot of times the Japanese cuts are very, very slim and they're meant for a certain body type. Not all of us are built that way. So this one here came out and I'm always keeping an eye on their next Fargo shirt since I know it fits me and I know my size. This one's pretty interesting though. This is a denim that was dyed with gunpowder. <laughs> so, I mean, it's a gimmick to be sure. I've never heard of anybody talking about the benefits of gunpowder dye, but it's a cool thing to talk about. Uh, I wouldn't get too close to a fire maybe, but it's expensive. They are beautifully made and, and absolutely worth it if this is your thing. Gunpowder though, gunpowder. <laughs> American Giant came out with a new collection called their American Vintage Collection. As a matter of fact, this is one right here. So I picked one up and you can see the little American Giant thing right here. Clearly they're kind of going after the old school 
uh, champion stuff. Now, it's something interesting about Champion, and this will tell you about how old you are. I know that it's a, a popular brand now, but back in my day, that was something that you got at like Caldors or, you know, a, it was a cheaper company, right? Like, cheaper company. If you were wearing Champion, it was the equivalent of wearing like uh, Kirkland now, okay? And nothing against Kirkland, love Kirkland, but it was definitely a bargain brand. Now it's funny because those guys have been elevated, but I guess back before that time of them being a bargain brand, they were really something. And I believe that this is a, a, a harken back to those days, the, the classic days of Champion. And again, this little insignia right here kind of, I think, told me all I need to know about what their goal was. Now, this is definitely a nice heavy fleece um, cotton. It's, I think, 16 ounce. Let me just take a look here, make sure I'm not telling you a whole line of crap. 16 ounce, see? Made in USA. Um, the pullover does not have strings, I noticed that. The, the cut on this is interesting. It's very tight. If you could tell this thing is very, you know, close to my neck here. I certainly had to do a little bit of this to stretch it out a tad, but it's a cozy, it's a cozy sweatshirt. Now, one of the things with American Giant, I'm not gonna ignore the elephant in the room. It seems like they've had a bit of issue uh, with fulfilling their orders and customer service. I certainly have heard about that through the Discord and, and, and other places. So, you know, not ignoring that they've had their problems. However, I will say that f from my perspective, kind of, which is, you know, only one, I, I bought their classic zip hoodie a long, long time ago. It's been fantastic. I have gotten several other pieces since then. The only one that I wasn't really crazy about was their flannel shirt, and that was more or less just because of the way it fit. Um, but I, I think their, their products are solid, and I think that what we're seeing here are maybe some growing pains from you know, growing into a much bigger company than they started out as. But either way, I still love their products. I, I haven't been let down by one, like I said, except for that flannel, which was more about a sizing thing. So, you know, I mean, they seem to be really good. I like this. I like it has a little bit of texture to it. It's certainly upgraded from what you would normally get at like, you know, it's your, your typical pullover kind of stuff. But I like it. It's, it's very good. But again, look, we got to admit when a company's doing something that might be, you know, um, might affect the end user. And when it comes to fulfillment, when it comes to customer service, that kind of stuff, it's worth doing your research. And so if you think this is for you, great. I would look into the company a little bit more, see what people are saying now. It looks like they're starting to kind of get that bicycle back on the right track. So let's give them the benefit of the doubt because I think they're a good company. They're making stuff in the USA, American cotton. And I think maybe we just saw some growing pains. That's my hope at least. Finally, what I've been listening to, what I've been watching and stuff, I've kind of liked this segment because I get to talk again with you guys about it. I have been listening to a lot of Tom Waits recently, and I got introduced to Tom Waits, oh boy, years and years ago. I remember the first time I had heard anything from him was actually on the way back from my buddy's bachelor party. So, you know, we were driving back, it was, it was me and a pal, and, and he was like, you know, you ever hear Tom Waits? I said, no, and he goes, well, we have a long time to drive, you wanna, you wanna hear some? So he put on Nighthawks at the Diner, and uh, I was like, at first I was kinda like, yeah, what is this, you know? It's like this kinda jazzy type of thing, and me being a metalhead through and through, I was like, what, what's going on? Uh, by the end of that trip, though, it certainly grew on me, and then from there, it was just a deep dive. Now, Tom Waits is an interesting character, and uh, he's also an actor. So you may have seen him in, in a couple of movies. My favorite uh, thing that he's ever done was in Buster Scruggs when he plays the prospector. Really interesting part. Cool movie too, it's on Netflix. And uh, he's just, his, his, his music catalog is all over the map. So you may like one album, you might hate the next. And I've certainly found the ones that I've liked. Um, Nighthawks of the Diner is a classic one. The I think it's called The Heart of Saturday Night, which was his first one. Um, then he went to this this experimental phase. Maybe the the most famous one I think is I think it's called Rain Dogs. I can't remember exactly. Uh, I'm trying to think back now. But either way, there are certainly little cuts off of each one that I really really like. And then his I think his last album was called Mule Variations, and uh, that's just a spectacular album through and through. A lot of them are good cover to cover. Sometimes though, you get into one where you just go, what what, what is this? You know. But either way, Tom Waits, really cool stuff. Um, again for a certain time. It's not necessarily what I would put on when I'm on the beach somewhere, but for this kind of gloomy, it's February, it's still, you know, everything's gray out there. It, it tends to match the mood and I like him. So, um, you know, one of the, the songwriters that you'll, you'll never hear him on the radio, 
you might hear a cover of his on the radio. You'll never hear his music, though, actually on, like, an FM station. But does anybody really listen to terrestrial radio anymore? I thought about that the other day. You know, it used to be a big thing if you got played on the radio. Now, other than listening to traffic and possibly weather, I never listen to the radio. It's not like podcasts, uh, Spotify. That's pretty much it. So, anyway, Tom Waits is kind of... He's always been there. Like, I've always listened to him in the background or whatever. But then I get these little moments where it just feels like the mood is right and and I'll kind of get into his catalog a little bit more. So anyway, let me know what you've been watching and listening to. I love talking to you guys about that kind of stuff. Anyway, I'm glad to be back. Uh, this is 20. 20. Episode 20 is in the books. That's, that's pretty crazy. So thank you for watching and I'll catch you later.